is the uh, free council meeting for January, July 15th, 2013, chaired by the Honorable Mayor uh, Tom Gerani and um, Christopher call the roll. Mayor Gerani? Here. Councilman Barber? Here. Councilman Burrell? <coughs> Councilman Hug? Here. Councilman McFarland? Here. Councilman Morris? Here. Councilman Odekirk? Here. Councilwoman Coleman? Here. Councilman Turk? Here. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, we have several presentations for you. The first one is a presentation on the Forest Park Initiative by Chief Trafton and other interested members of the community. Chief. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, September of last year, I was contacted by Betty Gavin from the Forest Park Community Center. Uh, Betty had just recently become the director of the center. Uh, Betty requested we meet with her and, and see if we could come up with ways to work together to improve the neighborhood and uh, improve the relationship between the neighborhood and the police department. Um, if you guys have not met Betty, and I think most of you have, uh, she's kind of a force of nature. Uh, when she gets going, she's hard to stop, and uh, I don't think you want to stop her. Um, but it's been a great relationship. Uh, we started, we met, and after we met, I decided, you know, we need to pull the figures from the neighborhood. We need to find out what's going on up there and how we can improve things. Um, in my 28 years with the police department, it's been a pretty traditional approach. Um, unfortunately, if you have a, a, a shooting victim or a crime of violence, uh, you respond. Sometimes we catch a guy, sometimes we don't. Um, what we need to do is figure out a better way of doing policing, a better way of, of helping the neighborhood and make it so there is not shootings in the neighborhood. And so the kids in the neighborhood don't see that as a way of life. Uh, what we need to do is, is show them that uh, the police department is not only there just to arrest people, we're there to help. We're there to be mentors and we're there to help these kids become the future Joliet police officers. Um, and that's our goal as we talked. Uh, wouldn't it be great if the future police officers from Joliet came from Forest Park? Much in the old days, how the Irish became the police. What if the Forest Park kids became the police? And that's part of our long range goal with this. So Betty got me interested, so I pulled some stats. And uh, the Forest Park community encompasses just 0.24 square miles of the city, approximately 11 full blocks. It's all located in 60432, and it's only 0.38% of the city with a population of just over 1,000 people. 41% of the people that live up there that are under the age of 18. It has 21 blocks and 319 housing units, and 60% of those are, are renter occupied. With that in mind, we conducted a, a shooting analysis at the end of 2012. It indicates that over the last two years, 12% shootings went down 12% throughout the whole city. But in this neighborhood, they increased 22%. So this one little section of the city, violence increased uh, astronomically. So again, we met with Betty and uh, we said, you know, Betty, what, what can we do better? How can we, how can we attack this? And uh, I guess what happened out of our meeting is we, we formed an initiative, and uh, after talking with Betty, we decided, you know, it's not just the police and Betty and the neighborhood council, great neighborhood council, Tammy Carson, Kathy Williams, very interested in improving the neighborhood. So we met as a group, and then it was decided that we needed help. We needed our park district, uh, Dominic Capizio, our business groups, uh, Terry Darcy and, and others like that to come up, and they've been meeting on a monthly <coughs> basis with us, along with state's attorney, Jim Glasgow. So we're continually working as a team to improve the neighborhood. And right now our stats are very good for the, you know, I don't want to jinx it, but we're doing very, very well up there. And, and uh, we've got some great plans coming up. We just received a $5,000 grant to mentor the children up there. We're going to do a camp with our neighborhood officers for a week-long camp in early August. Uh, we're going to use our park district facilities. Uh, Dominic has arranged that. So we're going to be a week with the kids. We're going to spend the money. We're going to get them fishing poles. They're going to go skating. They're going to do things they've never done. Um, after one of these meetings up there, uh, a neighborhood woman came to me and said, Chief, you know what these kids don't have? They don't have hope, and they need hope. So hopefully we can give them a little of that. And uh, I know, Betty, you want to talk about what we're doing up there, and we wanted to let you guys know what we're doing. Thank you for the opportunity. And let me first say thank you to Dominic Aguizio, to my dear friend. Oh, this man is absolutely amazing, Terry Darcy and our Will County State's Attorney, Jim Glasgow, as well. This collaborative has been amazing. We understand, and I think a lot of you have heard me say, that it takes an entire community to come together to remove barriers that will enable our citizens to become successful. Well, this is that community 
Joliet has been amazing. This council has been amazing. And the agencies, the businesses, the faith-based community came when I called. And we have been working together to formulate this project and this initiative. And it has gotten everybody excited. The community residents are excited. Matter of fact, tonight we will be meeting again at 7 o'clock. But people are coming out and lending a hand and giving and restoring that hope back to the community. This, we hope, will spread out throughout the city because we need this. We need a collaborative team working, thinking outside of the box and coming together with projects and programs that make us all successful. We know that in the Forest Park community, strong families make strong communities. And as we work together and provide programs and services and undergird and, and, and take our youth and develop them, as the chief said, it would be amazing if the next police officers that he's able to hire and the city's able to hire, they come from Forest Park. That would be amazing. The other portion about partnering with these agencies, especially the police department, is that we have to redirect the focus of our young people. We know that they look at our police department and, and local government through a different prism. And we need to change that. And so starting August the 5th, Chief is a brave man. He's taking about 15 of my residents uh, with them on a uh, week-long camping. And they're going to be getting an opportunity to do some things that they have not been able to do. Again, the Joliet Park District, uh, the, our business community, Mr. Darcy, everybody who is involved with this project <coughs> needs to be commended on this piece because it, it's going to take the entire city, our village, to raise uh, the children there. And we are excited about it. I had residents calling me at the center. They are so excited about our neighborhood policing team. These guys are amazing, and great things are happening, and we want it to continue to happen. So I just want to thank you all again for this opportunity. I thank uh, everybody involved in this table uh, for their collaborative efforts and the work that they're putting in and the energy that they're putting in. And we just thank you so much for that. I, d I just can't say enough about how this is going to reshape and redirect my community. Thank you so much. And I just uh, wanted to let the council know, Councilman Morris has been on our board and has been there from the beginning with the initiative as well, so he deserves some credit as well. Um, again, this uh, money is a $5,000 grant. Um, we're gonna use some um, seized money, so no money coming out of the budget, also to uh, help buy some vans for the neighborhood, uh, for the Forest Park Center, along with uh, Terry Darcy and State's Attorney Jim Glasgow is also using seized funds. And again, that's, uh, that's a use of money that we took from the bad that we're gonna use for the good. So uh, I thank you for your time. You. Sounds like a great idea, Chief. Thank you. Chief, what's the age range that you're gonna take these kids camping? Well, I, I, I have to be honest with this one. Uh, I'm pointing it off on my neighborhood officers, <laughs> but actually uh, 12 years old, correct? Is that what we're, yeah. So it, it's gonna be really a great camp for them. Yeah. It really will. Okay. Tom. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, the next uh, presentation is from Pam Owens, the executive director of the City Center Partnership. I asked Pam to come to the podium and uh, give us some of her insight after having been on the job for a little over two months. Um, thank you and good evening. Uh, the first thing I have to say is, wow, I, I loved hearing uh, the presentation that preceded mine. Um, and this is one of the reasons why I love being in Joliet because um, there's just such uh, working together and what a hopeful and um, 
story of, of something that a neighborhood group should be very proud of. So uh, that was very exciting. I was glad to hear that. Um, so I, I'm going to be talking to you about something that um, I hope will be a great source of pride within the community as well. And that is downtown. Um, I've, as Tom said, I've been on the job for about two months now and uh, we've really hit the ground running. I'm, I'm impressed with the commitment of, of great people on, on our board as well as so many working committees. And when I say working committees, I mean these folks are, are seriously not just filling seats but willing to roll up their sleeves and, and do the best they can to um, continue the revitalization of downtown Joliet. Uh, Joliet City Center Partnership Board um, just met last week and uh, even during my hiring process, one of the, the main initiatives that they wanted to accomplish when um, they had a new director in place was to update the, the downtown uh, master plan and an economic development plan for downtown. Um, one that um, was more than just pretty pictures, but that had some action plans, some, some real meat to it that we could, um, like I said, get our, roll up our sleeves and get to work to um, bringing new businesses downtown, um, strengthening and bolstering the downtown economy, and um, bringing not only members of the community downtown um, for shopping and entertainment, uh, but also um, people from the surrounding communities um, to, to come downtown and enjoy uh, downtown Joliet. Joliet City Center Partnership is committed to uh, downtown economic development, the marketing of downtown Joliet, um, management and social programming and as you know there are plenty of events downtown um, we're in the process right now of updating our website and making it a much more comprehensive tool for um, residents as well as visitors to the community to to find our downtown businesses and to enjoy the events that we have downtown and most importantly um, the realization of the city center master plan uh, last week the city center board voted to um, commit $50,000 to updating the city center master plan. And over the past month or so, um, members of the Economic Development Committee for um, City Center Partnership have met with city staff and identified some of the components that we would like to include in the RFP for a, a downtown master plan update. And so I wanted to share that with you this evening. Um, first, I'm going to backtrack a little bit. And I did a little digging myself because I wanted to understand the history of um, the downtown revitalization strategy in Joliet. And um, it looks as if um, the initial push began in the late 1980s um, to begin utilizing the, the riverfront corridor and um, to help bolster the economy of the existing businesses. Um, the concentration, as I said, was on the riverfront with over $128 million invested in downtown redevelopment at that time. As you know, Will County seat is um, the city of Joliet, houses the Will County seat and serves as um, a service center for the circuit court system. Um, many residents um, come into downtown Joliet. So downtown is um, not only the heart of the community for Joliet, but it really is the heart of Will County as well. And as a, an ideal location for um, supporting offices of the circuit court system. Will County has been growing in leaps and bounds over the past decade and economic needs have been created um, throughout the city. We feel that it's very important to update the master plan and to take a look at that growth so that we can capitalize best on um, where the growth can have a positive impact in downtown and we can develop strategies to um, make sure that we utilize that growth um, for the best possible potential for downtown revitalization. Why is downtown Juliet important? Um, I'm such a firm believer in, in downtowns in every community, um, especially in Juliet. As you, as you well know, this is a very competitive area. We have many surrounding communities that have um, really spent a lot of time and effort and money and energy in revitalizing their downtowns. So we are in a very competitive market. We're not standing out here alone, but we're competing with all of those other communities surrounding us. Um, 
downtown Joliet is a symbol of the health of the entire economy of the city. It represents public and private investment, um, local quality of life. The pride that we have within our community is evident in our downtowns. Community history is housed here and community identity. This is, uh, downtowns are normally where communities began. Uh, the roots are here in downtown. Downtown is the heart of the community for residents, government, culture, and churches, and it's an important community gathering place. Downtown houses small businesses. Small businesses are the success stories of tomorrow. Often uh, an entrepreneur looks to a downtown first because they can't afford the rents in, in malls or they can't afford the rents in strip malls. So this is, downtown is a, a large business incubator, so to speak. Local businesses are the backbone of every community. They support local families who support local schools and local charities. Local businesses <coughs> keep their profits within the community. Downtown is important for the local economy because large developers often, even if their development is not located in downtown, will head to the downtown and it's often a gauge of the, the, the pride within the community and the quality of life within that community. Investment in downtown provides a return to taxpayers through increased property taxes and providing local jobs. Updating the Joliet City Center Master Plan. Um, these were the components that we felt were most important that needed to be included in the plan. Um, economic vitality, civic identity, culture, and entertainment. And as you can see, we, those are pictures of downtown as it is right now, and we have all of those things. We just need to um, work on uh, putting their best face forward. These were the components that um, we would like to include in the RFP. They would be the Chicago Street Corridor, a downtown economic development plan, a GIS study, and um, a possibly exploring the extension of, of the TIF district. The Chicago Street Corridor is very important as it will um, link downtown to the multimodal transportation station that's currently under construction and, and hopefully um, draw those, those commuters and travelers into the downtown core district. It will create pedestrian and bike connections to downtown. Um, we would like that plan to include a design and um, update the downtown streetscape with appropriate roadway cross sections and a wayfinding plan for downtown. A downtown economic <coughs> development plan. We would like to provide an implementable, which means a workable plan, something that um, gives us uh, some guidance in first steps and second steps and so forth for guiding growth and development in downtown. We would like to have market feasibility studies highlighting demand, market constraints, and market parameters. We would like to analyze incentive tracks and um, where would be the first places where we could begin to look at attracting potential developers and create a scope of work for the purpose of forming an agreement with the master broker that we could contract with to market those identified um, tracks that we would like to begin developing first. And a GIS study is very, very important in downtown. Um, as you can see, the, the sheet there that is beneath the pictures is a, a downtown building inventory sheet. We would really like to um, assess what we have. Um, what buildings do we have? Um, which ones do we need to save? Which ones um, are, are not necessary to um, at contributing to the downtown? What um, businesses are already currently housed within those buildings and what vacancies do we have? Um, and then once we identify those vacancies, we want to um, be able to talk to the building owners and see how we can work with them to um, fill those vacancies and get those properties sold. We want to define the parameters of a downtown district, identify primary land uses and catalytic opportunity sites, um, create a comprehensive downtown building inventory, assess the parking inventory um, and future parking plans, and identify redevelopment opportunities and potential projects within that downtown district. Working together, um, what we would like to ask City Council is um, a partnering with us in accomplishing the update of the downtown master plan. And, and we would ask the council 
um, please consider allotting TIF funds of $75,000 to uh, match our $50,000 contribution um, to updating the downtown master plan. So I, I would ask that you take that under advisement. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, perhaps Pam could um, have her board members uh, stand. I think you have quite a few here today, so at least you can see who's on the board of directors of the City Center Partnership. And uh, I think you recognize everybody uh, who's here. Uh, we have gone through a process over the last year, and uh, you can have a seat now, um, uh, of trying to reconstitute the board and get uh, a more business focus of the City Center Partnership. Um, and these are the board of directors who uh, went through the process of recruiting an executive director, and we ended up with Pam. And I know we've had some very productive meetings over the last three or four months, uh, especially the last two since Pam's been on board. Uh, my focus, obviously, is to continue what I've been talking about for five years, uh, building the relationship with the county, uh, dealing with the vacant buildings once and for all. Uh, I know we've, we've been very patient with property owners, especially those who are long-term Joliet families, but the reality is we've got to have a plan in place to deal with these vacant buildings that have sat for 20 or 30 years, um, deal with underutilized buildings and try to revitalize those, uh, and then look at ways of bringing in, not just, as Pam said, pretty pictures, but bring in um, somebody who can go out and market downtown for us and bring business to us. Uh, we do have to fill the toolbox and part of that will be extending the TIF <coughs> that was approved about 11 or 12 years ago uh, with about uh, 10 or 11 years left on it. It really doesn't have the economic vitality that it needs to have. And we also start, we need to start looking at the special service area that has actually been in place since 1976, but we started using it for the city center partnership in 1996. We extended it in 2006. It'll be back before you in 2016, but we think now's the time to start talking about that because as we go out and talk to potential developers, they're going to want to know the stability of the city center partnership and whether they'll be around long enough to help implement the plan. Uh, we started the plan a few years ago. Uh, we got sidetracked with the transportation center, but we think now's the time to have a plan developed. Uh, not the pretty picture plan, but the implementation for economic development plan and move forward with that. Uh, we do have TIF funds available that have to be spent in the downtown area. The TIF district is the general downtown business district bounded by the river and the um, high level tracks. So we think this is a good expenditure. The board is uh, unanimous in the support for spending the TIF funds for that. Our cap would be $75,000. 50,000 coming from the city center partnership. We would bring back to you a series of proposals for your approval so we can move forward and you'll have a, a voice in who is hired to do the study and the plan and uh, implementation time and things like that. So we'd like uh, the green light from you to move forward with that project so the partnership can bring a proposal back to you. And uh, we think that you'll see uh, great results coming from the efforts of the partnership. If there's no objection, Seeing none, uh, go ahead, Tom, bring something back to us. Okay, we will do that. Pam, thank you very much. Thank Keep up the much. good work. Thank you. Sure. Mr. Mayor, related to that topic, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, related to that topic, we thought it'd be appropriate <coughs> to give you a quick update on the Transportation Center. I know you've seen some progress, but I'm going to ask Kendall Jackson, project manager, to come forward. And I know Kendall and Lisa Dorothy and others have been working very hard on uh, a lot of the uh, smaller things that you don't see and I don't see, but I thought this would be a good time to give an update on the plan. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, uh, this is just a quick update on the Transportation Center, and we'll start uh, with this overview. Uh, most of the work uh, that's been uh, uh, going on has been in the southwest quadrant, and that's where the new surface uh, uh, commuter lot is. Uh, we recently uh, opened that lot uh, over the past few weeks. Uh, prior to that, uh, late last year, we opened the uh, 63 South Ottawa lot, and that was um, a lot to accommodate the uh, county uh, workers uh, from the uh, courthouse. Uh, we needed to move them off of that property uh, in order to move forward with our new uh, commuter lot. Uh, so uh, that work has been done. Uh, we are shifting our focus to the uh, northeast quadrant, and that would be uh, directly across from the uh, ballpark. And that's our next phase of construction. Uh, that's bid package 2A. 
which is the relocation of the uh, Rock Island uh, passenger uh, platform. Uh, the, these are uh, just pictures of the new commuter lot in that southwest quadrant. Uh, the uh, gated system uh, that you see there, that's the uh, entryway uh, into the new lot. Uh, we also have a new pay station uh, that we've uh, constructed in that lot as well. Uh, these are just images of the county lot which has been open since late last year. Uh, quickly moving to the northeast quadrant, um, we have a um, uh, contract uh, with John Burns uh, Construction. Uh, they are the uh, general contractor for this portion of the work, and that is the relocation of the Rock Island platform. Uh, we have concurrence from IDOT to move forward uh, with construction. We also have a right of entry agreement uh, that was completed by Metra to allow us uh, access uh, onto property that they still own uh, in order to uh, construct that platform. Um, we had a meeting uh, this morning with John Burns, Burns Construction. That was our first uh, construction update meeting. Uh, they will get started quickly this week. Uh, tomorrow they will be on site uh, with um, site control as well as traffic control. Uh, so they'll, they're moving forward uh, rather quickly. Also, uh, if you recall, uh, part of the Rock Island platform construction uh, was a new parking deck, uh, Jefferson Street parking deck, uh, which was a 400 uh, lot deck. Uh, and that also provided vertical access on the uh, west end of the platform. Um, because we had to move rather quickly on the Rock Island platform construction, uh, we shifted our plans a bit and created a new uh, elevator uh, access on the east end of the platform uh, to, move, to move forward with the construction. Uh, at some point, we will need to um, come back and address uh, this, uh, this parking deck. Uh, we currently have about 850 parking spaces with the opening of the new uh, commuter lot. Um, with all of the activity that's anticipated at the transportation center, uh, including perhaps future high-speed rail, uh, more, more commuters uh, using our facility, uh, we, we will reach a parking crunch at some point. So those 400 additional uh, parking spaces uh, will be needed. Uh, also, that uh, deck included about 6,000 square feet of uh, retail space on the first floor. Uh, that's, uh, what, that was another uh, amenity that we felt was needed, uh, particularly for that stretch, stretch of Jefferson Street uh, right across from the ballpark. And I think that concludes the update. Very good. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, on bid package 1A, which is the commuter lot with uh, the pictures that Kendall showed you, um, Lisa Dorothy, who has run that contract, indicated to me on Friday that uh, that project came in at 1.2% over budget. Okay, and that uh, relatively close. Obviously, our goal is to bring all of these projects in at budget, uh, but we did encounter some uh, subsurface issues that uh, weren't part of the original contract. We had to pay a little extra to uh, Faro on that, and that's what caused it to go over uh, uh, budget. But we're pleased, though, that a, a project of that magnitude came in so close to uh, budget, which is good news for the remainder of the project. It, try to keep us on, uh, on, t on the uh, budget night uh, items on that. Um, the parking deck, Kendall showed you, and let's, if we can go back to the first slide that you showed on that, Kendall. Um, we actually paused on the parking deck because the platform project wasn't ready to move. Um, the commuters were given notice last week that they would have to find other spaces to park. There are probably, I don't know, close to 100 spaces that are affected by this. So I'm sure most of them will end up in our new commuter lot. So you'll see some additional usage there starting uh, tomorrow. Um, it's good news uh, that that's starting. Um, we also needed to work with NICOR and ComEd on, on utility relocations. That hadn't occurred uh, in time for us to start the parking deck this year. So that's why we thought it was a good idea to put that on hold. Uh, we still think it's a key piece of the project. We still need to look at finding a way of making that happen. Uh, we do have some uh, uh, cost items to deal with. Originally, we were going to pay for that out of the, out of the transportation center budget, uh, finance it with the bond issue, but we decided to hold off on that. Um, the 
architectural firm of Cordigan and Clark from Chicago did the, did the design work on it, worked with Next Parking and Mr. Tinsley on developing uh, a plan for that site. We do have some bills on that. You'll be seeing those, but my recommendation is to pay that. It's about $90,000 that we would be paying now. This is work that needs to be done, that needed to be done anyway. So you'll see some uh, line items coming in, the uh, bills to be paid at a future meeting for those. Um, what we'd like to do, though, is resurrect the project uh, and start looking at uh, going out for requests for proposals for what we originally started with, and that was a privately constructed deck on what will be city-owned property. In other words, not expose Joliet to the risk of the, uh, the revenues from there to pay off the debt on it, but see if we can uh, find uh, an interested developer willing to take that on. Uh, we think in this market, especially with borrowing rates being relatively low, we may be able to find somebody like that, and it's worth the endeavor. Uh, so what we'd like to do is square up with Cordigan and Clark, uh, move forward with an RFP that would all obviously come back to you for final approval uh, if we're able to find somebody that would uh, be able to do this for us. I think you can see, and Kendall, if you want to go back to the slide before that, uh, this, this would be a significant improvement because you'll have people being able to park on a level, if they get there early enough, they'll park on a level that will not require them to uh, uh, walk too far to get on the Rock Island line, probably 50, 60 feet if they get there early enough. And we think with the ballpark across the street, and I'm sure you've seen that, uh, the slammers numbers are up for the last uh, few home stands, so you know, good news on that front. Um, but we think that it will be a key piece. So what we'd like to do is move forward with an RFP, see if we can attract private investors to make this happen. Uh, the original group can certainly uh, submit a proposal, but we think that's worth that exercise first before we get into any kind of project that's financed by the city directly. Cameron? Sure. Sure, uh, Tom. So just to be clear for myself, um, the original concept that we kind of gave you authority to move forward on which was going to be a public-private partnership, and in fact, if there wasn't enough revenue, the city would have to make up the difference. We've put that on hold because we're looking to make sure, see if we have any um, private private partnerships, so to speak, out there that will take the full risk. Yes, that's exactly right. Uh, we weren't ready to build the deck this summer. We had hoped to, to build it. We were hoping the platform project would have started earlier. Uh, it didn't, and uh, at this point, it makes more sense to look at 2014 for the deck. But we thought, let's spend the time now for um, uh, exploring to see if there's uh, another private investment group that'd be willing to step in and help uh, help build the, the, the uh, uh, deck so we don't have risk for the city of Joliet taxpayers. Will we be giving them, selling them, or leasing them the land? I think uh, all of the above would be in the mix, but I think it would be a lease. Uh, I think the city would want to maintain some kind of control. Uh, certainly, uh, we, you know, we need to look at long term and uh, I think we've learned from Chicago that perhaps selling parking assets may not necessarily be the most effective way of handling parking issues in an urbanized downtown. Um, I think it would be a long-term lease and obviously with sufficient time for return on investment. I think this is an important part of the puzzle, and I, I really feel we should look at that and put it back on the board. Yeah. And I, I think we've all, uh, I, those <coughs> who have been involved with the project from the beginning, uh, this, uh, the design that Cordigan and Clark has brought forward is, is fits very nicely. Uh, you'll see that um, uh, something that Chuck Smith from uh, Knight Engineering had suggested doing the, uh, the light tower at the top that will match the light tower that's at the bus terminal that will be built next year. It, it just seems to be able to draw the entire transportation center complex together. So we're uh, very excited about the design. Uh, we just want to find someone to pay for it and uh, make it happen. Kendall, one last thing, uh, unless somebody else has not Could you walk us through uh, dates and when this is going to be <coughs> all come to fruition? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I'll, I'll need to go back. Okay. Okay, this is probably the best slide. So uh, the Rock Island platform, uh, we'll, we'll start this week. Uh, and we're hoping to um, push that through the end of the year uh, for completion that, that, that may go over into uh, 2014, um, at which point uh, we will be in a position to go out to bid for um, the, the bus facility. Uh, that will probably take the better part of 2014. Um, in, in the interim, 
once the Rock Island uh, platform c goes live, we'll need to do um, a temporary office uh, for Metra. Uh, so that will be in a trailer. Um, uh, so that will be a project that happens very quickly as well. Uh, once all of that work is done and complete and the Rock Island train can stop on the east side of that rail intersection, um, both the UP and, the, and BNSF will come through with a rail project uh, that will probably take the better part of uh, 2014, uh, maybe into 15 to complete. They need to uh, do a track realignment uh, to make room for the new Heritage Corridor platform as well as improvements to what's called the interlocker, which is the uh, rail uh, intersection. Uh, so we need to quickly wrap up the uh, Rock Island platform to get out of their way in order to complete that. Um, there will also be a temporary uh, heritage corridor platform um, that would be built um, adjacent to the uh, uh, baseball field on um, Mayor Schultz Drive in order to allow passengers access to uh, the trains uh, while the uh, heritage court the new heritage corridor platform is being constructed uh, the final piece will be the new transportation center itself which is the train station uh, and that's probably a 2015 uh, construction item but do you estimate how long that'll take to that's probably uh, a better part of a year to complete Kendall, the questions? bus turnaround also, why don't you address that too, please? Yes, the, the, the bus turnaround uh, could start next year. Um, that would probably take um, a, a year to complete. Uh, we do have a uh, $1.7 million grant uh, that's coming through PACE in order to complete that work. Um, that will also require the um, uh, improvement to St. Louis Street, uh, which we've Put on hold a bit because we need to acquire uh, the Ace Metals uh, property, so that's in the works now. Uh, and once that property acquisition uh, is complete, we can begin uh, work on St. Louis Street and then the balance of the uh, the bus turnaround facility. Uh, the bus turnaround facility will be the first vertical construction, uh, the first building uh, that comes out of the ground. Kendall, that's fully designed too, I believe, right? The Correct. bus turnaround is 100% designed by night. Yes, that's, uh, they're, they're, they will be submitting their 100% plans uh, over the next s several days, so it, it is complete, the design work. Jim, you have a question? I just ask Tom, before this comes back to the council, could we run this through land use with the uh, the parking garage? Yes. And the details? Yes. And the money. Mm -hmm. right, thank you. We'll do that. Your Honor. Uh, Kendall, at what point in the phase is the, um, the sound proofing or whatever they call it for the consisting Union Station Hall. I know it, it's a beautiful f facility, but the, the acoustics are pretty poor in there. Yeah, that can actually happen at any time. Uh, that's another project that we need to come back and address, as well as the balance of Union Station. Um, one of the things that we had Knight, our um, design consultant on this project do, was a Union Station stabilization report. And that, that work was completed about a year ago, and it included um, facade um, um, uh, work for the station, uh, some of the stabilization types of things that need to happen internal to the building as well. Uh, that will take um, probably another pot of money uh, to do that. We are currently seeking grants uh, some of the work will be completed through um, the transportation center funding, and that will be a, a new connecting tunnel uh, between the old station and the new station. Uh, that will all be uh, paid for through the grant. But the balance of the work that has to happen in Union Station, uh, we'll, we'll need to uh, find the funding source for that. Thank you. Anybody else? John? I just have one question. How, how much is that funding source you're looking for, Kendall, as far as that mm -hmm. stabilization of the existing? The stabilization report um, called for about $2 million uh, in, in funding. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Thanks, Kendall. Great job. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, I think that compl uh, concludes the presentations uh, that are before you today. Um, I know some of our friends may need to get to other meetings, so they're certainly welcome to <coughs> depart if they need to or stick around. Uh, if they'd like. Um, uh, before we get to citizens to be heard, I've got three uh, business matters to bring uh, to move forward on the agenda. Thanks First for coming, folks. First item is Council Memo Number 302-13, 302-13.
Uh, this is a recapture agreement for the Stone City Commercial Park. Uh, you saw this a few weeks ago when we approved the uh, convenience store uh, uh, facility at the southwest corner of Laraway and Route 53. Uh, that developer is making certain public improvements that will benefit an adjacent commercial piece uh, that is, uh, goes by the name of Schloss Development LLC. Uh, that's $153,500 worth of work that should be the uh, expense of Schloss. What's before you is a recapture agreement uh, to be recorded against the Schloss property. So when that develops, uh, the, the developer will be obligated to reimburse the developer of the convenience store parcel uh, for the for <coughs> improvements. Uh, Mr. Hansen is present to answer any questions you may have regarding the uh, proposed recapture agreement. Uh, staff has reviewed it, and we're making a recommendation to approve it. Tom, didn't we have one of these for the uh, Chicagoland Speedway also? Something like We did yeah. many years ago. Yeah, right. Actually, the drag strip, I think, is when okay. yeah. 1996 right. was when that the came The most in. recent one was Duke, was it not? We did one on Duke for uh, the, the water line. line. For the water main, right. Yeah. Okay. That's the same prototype we're using here. Yes. I moved and approve. Second. It's been motion and seconded that said ordinance and resolution be adopted. Councilwoman Barber. Aye. Councilman Girl. Aye. Councilman Hug. Aye. Councilman McFarland. Aye. Councilman Morris. Aye. Councilman Odekirk. Aye. Councilwoman Quillman. Aye. Councilman Turk. Aye. Mayor Gerani. Aye. Motion carried. Thank you very much. Sure. Mr. Mayor, members of the uh, council, let's stay in the same neighborhood. Uh, we'll go directly across the street. Council Memo 300-13, 300-13, and that is a revised preliminary plat, uh, final plat, and recording plat for the Laraway Crossings Business Park subdivision. Uh, this project goes back about uh, ten, uh, about 12 years ago when the city council first approved uh, a light industrial project at the northeast corner of Laraway and 53, same intersection. Uh, William Bone, president of Jacob and Hefner uh, Associates, present today to answer any questions you may have. Uh, this is basically updating plats that have expired. There are a couple of uh, warehouses that are already built on the property. Uh, the uh, I believe the Public Service Committee had a chance to review this at its meeting right before this meeting, and I think Mr. Trisna probably went over the funding uh, mechanism. There's still public improvements that need to be done to Laraway uh, and the intersection. Uh, the developer, Laraway, uh, it's actually, uh, I don't re uh, Ryan. Ryan Companies. Uh, has deposited a little over $2.7 million with the City of Joliet through the Finance Department uh, to cover the cost. So we'll be handling that rather than having the developer handle it. Uh, and Mr. Bone is present to help get the plats up to date. Uh, there was a sale, I believe, of the two buildings. It's a right. potential sale of, of some of the additional property. So we're starting to see some things move. Uh, it's all good news as far as we're concerned. Uh, this did go to the plan commission. Plan commission recommended its approval unanimously. Staff is doing the same. And Mr. Bone is present to answer any questions you any may have. Any questions? Uh, one question here, Mayor. Sure. And it might be more for Tom Dennis. The $2.7 million is for the uh, required improvements. Yes. Um, obviously, we've not bid it out. Do we know that $2.7 million, when it comes time to make the improvements, will cover it? Yes. We've actually been doing this for five years now. As the subdivisions have gone through some difficult times, whether it's been foreclosure, bankruptcy, or in this case, uh, just uh, a developer who's hung on <coughs> uh, but has agreed to live up to its or its commitments that were made back in 2001, uh, we've been working out cash uh, contributions to the city in lieu of having the public improvements done. What we do is have Jim Trisna and his team uh, estimate the projected cost based on recent bids that we've received to make sure that we're getting enough money to get the work done. Uh, we've been able to hit the mark or do better on every single one that we've done so far. I'm confident the staff can, you know, has, has sized this one right. Uh, our philosophy is we'd rather get the cash in hand than rather let this linger any longer because we'd like to get the, the improvements done. Getting Laraway Road done is important because Chicagoland Speedway, we've got a lot of business parks that uh, benefit from it, and we think it's, a, it's, it's good to move on it. I think Jim will see engineering done this year. And this fall and construction done in 2014. Yeah. So moved. Second. Krista. Said motion and said ordinance be adopted. Councilman Girl. Aye. Councilman Hug. Aye. Councilman McFarland. Aye. Councilman Morris. Aye. Councilman Odekirk. Aye. Councilwoman Coleman. Aye. Councilman Turk. Aye. Councilwoman Barber. Aye. Mayor Gerani. Aye. Motion carried. Thank you. 
Mr. Mayor, members of the council, the last item to be moved up is council memo number 305-13, 305-13, and that's a resolution approving an economic incentive agreement between the city of Joliet and what will be Joliet Hotels, LLC, uh, also uh, the Hospitality <coughs> Guru Group, LLC. Uh, I know you're well aware of the facts behind this. Uh, the proposal for the incentive package is set forth in uh, uh, attachment or exhibit B to the agreement. On uh, page 18, it is consistent with what was presented to you in early June. The only modification we've made is to take the uh, proposed restaurant that will be inside the complex and not have the restaurant business be eligible <coughs> for any kind of sales tax or food and beverage tax rebate. Uh, I know there was a concern expressed by a nearby restaurateur about the level playing field, and we thought this might be a good way of addressing that. So uh, the uh, developers of the hotel have agreed to the proposal we made to them uh, about a week ago about, about removing that. Uh, that. The value of that incentive was about $200,000. So what we're proposing is shifting that $200,000 benefit over to two things. One would be the um, impact fee, the development impact fee. It's an ordinance that was passed probably about seven or eight years ago that adds an additional fee to uh, development like this. And then building permit fees and giving a credit of $165,000 towards those fees uh, to, the, to this developer. Uh, and then we pr uh, propose that the ad remaining $35,000 would come from a rebate of sales tax that this developer may pay to any Joliet-based businesses this developer does business with in, during the construction phase of the project. So if they buy um, uh, desks and TV sets from a local vendor and pay a sales tax, that sales tax would be eligible for rebate up to $35,000. So the developer has the benefit of the bargain we struck earlier, back in early June, um, and we've also addressed the issue with the level playing field with the nearby restaurateur and other restaurants. So we think that this is a big step forward for the city. Uh, we're very excited about this project. I know the developers are present to answer any questions you may have. Uh, staff is recommending the <coughs> approval of the proposed incentive agreement. Yeah. So this is, one second, this is an incentive for them to buy equipment locally. Yes. Yeah, they, they, if idea. they don't buy their equipment locally, then they won't get the benefit right. of that $35,000 incentive. Obviously, they've expressed to us uh, their firm commitment to trying to do as much business locally as they possibly can. Councilman, um, Your Honor, uh, Tom, can this be voted on today? Yes. Okay. I'll move this approval uh, to get it on the floor. I'll second. second. Okay. Discussion? Questions? It's been motion and seconded. Said resolution be adopted. Councilman Hug. Well, we were, we were creative here to be able to, to address, and, and hopefully we have more development coming down the road that we can encourage, and certainly in this economy it, it does include incentives. Um, it did spawn the, the conversation about an equal playing field ordinance that I was kind of pushing for. I spoke with our uh, attorney about that. So it's kind of separate of this now, but I just wanted to make people aware that we're still looking into it. And if, correct me if I'm wrong, Jeff, um, uh, the suggestion you had, which I thought was great, was that uh, you would continue to go through and then at some point when the Economic Development Committee is appointed and seated, it would be a good first topic for EDC to look over that. It seemed like a natural. So um, I would vote aye on this. Councilman McFarland? I would say Councilman Goodall got his cake and got to eat it too. I vote aye. Councilman Morris? Aye. Councilman Odekirk? Yeah, Tom, I, I just want to thank you for addressing these concerns. I think this is good compromise by all parties involved. Thank so you. thank you and I vote aye. Councilwoman Coleman? I would also like to thank you for the compromise with the local business owner and I'll vote aye as well. Councilman Turk? Aye. Councilwoman Barber? Aye. Councilman Girl? I do want to thank Tom. I know we had, a, uh, there was a lot of concern with respect to, uh, you know, uh, the uh, local restaurateur as far as how is that was, gonna, was going to affect his business. I think this is a great compromise. And uh, um, thanks again, Tom, for sticking in there and making this work for all parties. I vote aye. Mayor Durrani. Uh Once again, Tom, great job. I vote aye. Motion carried. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, uh, we can go back to the regular agenda, citizens to be heard. Uh, Mr. Webb had called uh, the clerk's office earlier today, indicated he's not available. Uh, Mr. Sellers uh, would like to address you on contract bidding process. Uh, good afternoon.
afternoon, Mayor and Council. Uh, my name is Willis Sellers, 707 Fourth Avenue. And uh, I just want some clarity on uh, city contracts and land use committee contracts. Uh, I was under the understanding that all contracts had to be bidded so everyone had the same opportunity to get the bids. Uh, and maybe uh, Jim Trishner, uh, you or someone can tell me if there's a difference between city contracts and land use committee contracts. I, I don't think so. Mr. Uh, members, all have to be mayors, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, um, I, I don't think there's anything such as land use committee contracts. I'm not sure which one you're referring to, but um, usually contracts that the land use committee may have reviewed would be something dealing with the transportation center, uh, but those always come back to the city council if they're uh, over $20,000. Well, uh, <clears throat> I've been getting phone calls and emails about a contract that you gave to uh, Jim Roberts uh, at the land use committee a uh, week or two ago and uh, with, with no bid process, a private developer. And I want to know how, how did that happen if it's, if it's no... Yeah. Actually, there was no contract awarded by the Land Use Committee, and as a matter of fact, I think the Land Use Committee asked us to revisit that issue. Mr. Roberts has made a proposal to develop some vacant lots in the city of Joliet. We currently have an inventory, and I don't know if Alfredo probably knows, but at least 25 or 30 lots, uh, single-family homes that need to have new houses on it so we can get families in those, those homes. And Mr. Roberts has come forward with a financing mechanism for um, developing those lots. Uh, there was a presentation made to the Land Use Committee. The Land Use Committee took no action on the proposal. As a matter of fact, asked the staff to look at other alternatives uh, to uh, the development and to what Mr. Roberts is proposing. They didn't say no to him, but they didn't say yes. And in order for Mr. Roberts to get a contract, it would have to come before the nine members of the city council. But is it going to be a bid process? Uh, there, how is it going to work? Yeah, there would be. And, and this is for the building of single-family homes on vacant lots. And that isn't necessarily a low, low bid process because uh, there are several rules that we have to follow. Uh, some are federally driven. Some are state driven. But what we would do is have an open process, uh, more than likely a request for proposals that would invite anybody interested in building single family homes in those lots to submit proposals and then show us financing for it um, and uh, all the other things that go with uh, building single family homes. Uh, we have some requirements as far as brick and the way it looks and things like that. Um, and we want to have some say in that, so that's why it would be a proposal process. It would be open, so if Mr. Sellers or somebody he knows would be interested in going through that process, um, you know, he needs to let us know and give us names of uh, contractors who build homes, and then we can uh, certainly add that person to the list. Doesn't the, the contractor have to get the, a local bank involved, et cetera, et cetera? It, There's a lot more to it than just bidding on a building a house. Yeah, yeah. obviously, uh, as we found out over the last six years, financing is the name of the game when it comes to building houses and, and uh, townhomes. And uh, there hasn't been a lot of financing out there over the last few years. Uh, the, Mr. Roberts has uh, been involved with Liberty Meadows and was able to uh, cobble together various levels of financing to make Liberty Meadows uh, what it is today. Certainly, the Housing Authority had a big role in it, as did the city, because the city gave, and I don't recall the exact number, but substantially over a million dollars towards Liberty Meadows to make that happen. Um, so in order to do that, you do have to have a lender as a partner, and that's what Mr. Roberts is bringing to the table. Certainly, if Mr. Sellers has lenders uh, willing to support him or his uh, uh, colleagues, that you know, we'd certainly want to look at that, too. Are we... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, to address your question, I today met with uh, Alfredo Malesio to uh, talk about what the status is of this project with Mr. Roberts. He's going to be taken under advisement. My meeting with him with the chairman of the Land Use Committee to kind kind of answer some of your questions. And maybe, Tom, when will we know what the next step is? Or Well, I think this will come back to the Land Use Committee for another presentation as to what the staff is recommending going forward. Having gotten the advice from the council, uh, from the Land Use Committee of the City Council. Um, Alfredo needs a little bit of time to work on that, and whenever the Land Use Committee has its next meeting, I'm sure we'll be ready for that if it's two, three weeks down the road. Mayor? Oh, yes. Just because I'm feeling this, maybe other folks watching, are, I just want to clarify. We have vacant properties owned by the city. 
we certainly aren't going to build houses on them. We're not in the we're right. We're not in the development business as far, as far as being developers. So you've got someone who has come to you and said, "I got a proposal where there's no risk to you as a city. I'm going to finance the building of it. I just need the land in an agreement, and then I'm going to sell the homes." Am I oversimplifying it? I don't think you are. Uh, there are some complexities that go with it, but and I'm not sure about the risk part. Uh, Joliet does have some participation in it, and I don't know the extent of it. Alfredo does uh, have those details, but when it gets back to the Land Use Committee, I think we can fully address it then. But I think, generally speaking, Councilman Hug, that's exactly what happened. Um, I think we wanted to run it by the Land Use Committee last week to see if they had interest in that type of a proposal. Uh, they did, but they also said, let's see what else is out there, and we're going to do that. And the only reason I brought it up is I wasn't at the Land Use Committee meeting for that particular thing. and. Uh, Unless I missed it, I didn't hear anybody mention who owned it. You know, to clarify it, we just went right into this conversation. And I wanted to clarify that it wasn't somebody who owns private property and wants to develop. It's a little bit more complicated because it's city-owned and a proposal in a very preliminary stage. These are several lots that we've acquired through the years. Either we had demolition cases and acquired title. We have acquired them through tax sales uh, very inexpensively. We've had them donated to us. There's just a lot of things. And then I think we have about 10 or 12 lots that we had donated to Unity CDC about three years ago or so, four years ago. Uh, we probably need to address those because Unity hasn't been in a position to get financing either. If we find the right program, uh, perhaps Unity can participate with us. Uh, just will, will there be any opportunities for some of the neighborhood people to maybe get some jobs? Uh, you know, like uh, I think it's the Forest Preserve, and one of them they have they get kids from the neighborhood and they kind of get like, like an apprenticeship program or something. Uh, you know, since we're gonna have some perks or some investment in it, we should. I think some people in the neighborhood should get some opportunities. I think that's the type of uh, part of the proposal that would be reviewed by the Land Use Committee and ultimately the City Council and might make a proposal more attractive than somebody not doing that. Yeah. Um, and and, and uh, I have, we haven't heard anything from the, uh, from the people that's uh, uh, going to be looking for a new city manager. We, was, we, was, we heard it said that there was going to be uh, some input from the community or we were going to get a chance to hear you know, what the process was or something of that nature. We've got to wait till we get all the uh, people that uh, apply in. We've got to wait to get all the applicants in before we can meet with the applicants. No, I'm not talking about the people. I'm talking about the company. They wanted to, you know, like you guys are going to tell them what you're looking for in a city manager. And I thought it was going to be like a form where we could come in and uh, some type of form that we could address some of our concerns or some things that we think a city manager should have or something. I thought that's what I heard. That, that has all been done. He met, they met with every one of the councilmen. They met with a couple of uh, citizens, and that's all been done. Oh, you, 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 you handpicked a couple of citizens. Huh? I certainly did. All right, thank you. Here. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, we can go back to the beginning of the agenda. Uh, the approval of the minutes for the July 1st and July 2nd meetings will be before you tomorrow evening. Uh, council committee reports will be before you also. Uh, these tre the treasurer's report uh, for May of 2013 will be before you tomorrow evening. Uh, council memo number 297-13 is the renewal of the property and casualty coverages for the city of Joliet. Uh, we've worked with Arthur J. Gallagher Risk Management Services, the city's agent broker for uh, those types of services. And you'll see on the second page of the council memo that our entire package is going up 1.27% over last year's uh, cost. Uh, this year's proposal is for six, just under $695,000. Last year's was just about uh, $686,000. Uh, staff has reviewed this. I believe the Finance Committee will be reviewing this at its meeting tomorrow afternoon. Uh, staff is recommending its approval, and we'll see what the Finance Committee says tomorrow. Uh, next item is Council Memo Number 298. I'm sorry, that's coming later. 299-13 on the order of the agenda. 299-13. That's a recommendation to solicit proposals for state advocacy and lobbying services. Uh, I've had uh, conversations with uh, the mayor and a few council members uh, as to whether the city needs to start looking at engaging a lobbyist uh, in Springfield and in Chicago for a lot of matters that uh, directly affect the city of Joliet. Uh, the primary uh, issue that we've been involved with for 
uh, every single year over the last five years has been the gaming bill. Um, but there are other things such as pension reform and uh, dealing with uh, the state's uh, use of current revenue streams that come to the city of Joliet, such as income tax, motor fuel tax, and sales tax, and other taxes that the state uh, legislature sometimes looks at as a potential way of helping their budget uh, problems. Um, we have, um, the, I've worked very closely with our local <coughs> legislators. Uh, we've had very good success in working with all of them. Uh, in helping us through the legislative process and the administrative process because it, this isn't just the legislature, but it's also dealing with state agencies like the uh, IEPA, uh, IEMA, which is the Emergency Management Agency, uh, Department of Revenue, and several others that have direct jurisdiction and impact over things that we do. What I have before you is a proposal for requesting proposals uh, from lobbyists who have a proven track record uh, I'm asking for authorization to go ahead and issue that, uh, invite proposals, have that come back to the mayor and city council, and then let, uh, let you decide whether any of those proposals uh, would make sense for the city of Joliet. Uh, this in no way locks us in to any kind of um, <coughs> obligation to do this. Uh, I'm all only asking for authorization to at least test the waters, see what the pricing would be, and see what kind of um, uh, you know, proposals we would receive. Uh, I know I've been contacted for the last five, five and a half years by many lobbyists who would be very interested in working for us. I've kept a, a list. I have a, about a dozen or so uh, names of lobbyists who I know on a one-on-one uh, -on -one basis from having been in Springfield and Chicago quite a bit. Uh, we, we'd certainly invite them. If you have anybody else you'd like for us to invite, I'd be happy to do that if you decide <coughs> to move forward with this. Tom, do uh, uh, you have any idea what kind of money we're looking for? I, I think the... Um, some of the other municipalities that have engaged lobbyists have seen anywhere from about $3,000 a month uh, up to seven or 8000 depending upon uh, the level of service. I think uh, we would certainly be looking at the entry-level cost of that, not a full-blown representation. I think we'd be looking for a lobbyist to come in and deal with gaming bill of number one, other main issues, um, and then also looking at helping develop a legislative agenda with you. Uh, this person would be in direct communication with the mayor and city council and the city manager and his staff um, and getting us more involved. Right now, um, sometimes I'll get a call to come down to Springfield in four hours and you know we'll respond uh, on an emergency basis, but it does help to have somebody who's at the rail, uh, dealing with these, uh, with these issues on a regular basis and knows the legislators, the speaker, um, the Senate president on a first name basis. Could someone like this help with our CSO project? Yes, yes. We, we have been able to secure a loan for a good portion of our CSO project. That's probably a $50 million project. We may have you know, anywhere from 30 to $45 million in a low interest loan from the IEPA uh, close to being secured but we definitely need some help with that because we don't want to see additional regulations that cause the cost of the project to go up even further. And that's a mandated project. That is. Yes. Anyone else? This will be on tomorrow's agenda for your consideration. <coughs> Next item is 298-13. Uh, it's a public hearing on the annexation of about 115 acres uh, along the Patterson Road corridor. Uh, 115 on one side, 110 on the other side, and then another 20-acre piece. Uh, this is uh, a piece, it's properties that have been acquired by Centerpoint uh, to expand the intermodal terminal and also to develop uh, additional industrial land. This will be going before the plan commission at its meeting later this week, and it will come back to you at your August 20th meeting uh, with a recommendation from the staff. So we're asking for you to table it tom uh, tomorrow night's meeting. Uh, we can't do that today. Cannot. We'll hearing, do that right? tomorrow. Right. <coughs> Next item is 300-13, uh, we'll at Lairway Crossings, which we've taken care of. Next item is 301-13. Uh, it's a reclassification of a one and a half acres at uh, 1001 to 1003 South Chicago Street. Currently, it's a house with R2 zoning on it. We're asking to uh, have it rezoned for I-1 light industrial. Uh, it's been acquired by the adjacent property owner who has an industrial operation at that site. Uh, this went before the plan commission uh, on June 20th. Uh, the, um, no one appeared in opposition. Plan commission recommended the um, uh, reclassification to I-1 zoning uh, by an eight to nothing vote. Staff is recommending the same. 
Next item is 302, uh, which is the Stone City uh, Commercial Park uh, recapture agreement, which you uh, took care of. Uh, next item, 303-13. It's a resolution um, authorizing a tax incentive for the Navistar distribution facility. This is something you actually took care of in September of 2010. Uh, at that time, I don't know if you recall, but Navistar uh, was looking at various sites for corporate headquarters. Uh, we had gotten ourselves in uh, the conversation, and we were able to work with the village of Lyle in securing an agreement with Navistar that would have the corporate headquarters go to, uh, Nav to Lyle, and the city would be able to, to see a distribution center relocated from another Chicago suburb to Joliet uh, in the uh, Cherry Hill Business Park. Um, part of the agreement was to offer a three-year, 50% tax abatement. Uh, and unfortunately, because of a problem with the pins, uh, we ended up giving the tax abatement only on one pin number, one parcel. There's actually two parcels there. What Navistar did was they bought an existing vacant uh, distribution center and then they also bought the lot next to it the, di the original distribution center was a little over 500,000 square feet and then they built an additional 340,000 square feet on to the original building it was the addition that did not get included in the original abatement so what we're asking you to do is to ratify what the intent of the council was in 2010 and that's to extend the three-year 50 percent tax abatement uh, I did follow up with uh, Mr. Luganbill, who was here in September of 2010, to tell us what was being proposed. And uh, glad to say they're uh, they're open. They had promised 100 and, uh, 100 new jobs coming to Joliet, um, and uh, Mr. Luganbill informed me on Friday that they have 136 employees at the site. And the payroll for last month was a total of $550,000. If you run the numbers, it's a little less than $50,000 per person. Uh, coming out of that facility. So um, all Navistar employees, uh, just a well-run operation, and it was certainly worth a small investment, a great return on investment for the city in getting involved with the discussions back in 2010 with the state and uh, the village of Lyle. Um, we're asking for um, renewal of what was originally uh, intended for this site. This is just a matter of cleanup, something that's already been done. It is, that's correct. The tax bill came out uh, beginning of May. Mr. Luganbill looked at it and it didn't have the full abatement on there. He called me immediately and we're addressing it now. We do this today? Yes, I think Councilman Hug looks like I had a question. question. Sure. Sure. Um, uh, there, there's other taxing bodies that were involved in the original, say, school district? Yes. And they gave both parcels? I, you know, I don't recall, and I know Jim's not here today, and I can find out for you, but I, I'm almost positive that we had participation from other taxing districts, and, and I'm not sure about the school, so I'd have to go back and I'm look. just curious if, the other, if, if it was just our mistake or if it was throughout the entire package that I, links all the taxing I, bodies. I don't together. know. I'd have to find out. Well, I know what our commitment was, and I just wanted to make sure we lived up to it. I would imagine that if it was a big mistake on the taxes, we only get a little portion of the taxes. I would imagine that most of it is for the schools, and that would have jumped out at them if you didn't get the... Uh, yeah, I just feel more comfortable if we had that information. Yeah. They may have included, and we'll find out. If you'd like to wait until tomorrow night, we can certainly do that and get the information for you. And we will do that. So next item, uh, three... 05-13 we've taken care of already uh, then before you will be the uh, regular payroll current bills treasurer's disbursements regular claims all for your review uh, tomorrow evening and the finance committee will be meeting tomorrow at I believe at 430 I think yes 530 530 and uh, that's a meeting that's open to the public uh, the remaining items on the agenda were addressed at the Public Service Committee uh, earlier today. I believe there will be recommendations made on that by the committee. Staff's recommending all of those. And then we have a proclamation for your consideration tomorrow evening, uh, <coughs> mayoral appointments uh, to two uh, different committees. And that concludes our presentation. I don't think Can we do those any. appointments tonight? I think we could. Yeah. Yes. Mr. Mayor and members of the council, it is uh, towards the end of your uh, packet. Uh, if you want to scroll to it, um, the mayor is recommending uh, for the Economic Development Committee, Councilman Mike Turk as chair, uh, Councilman Gerani uh, as a member, and Councilwoman uh, Quillman as a member of the Economic Development Committee. For the Housing Authority of Joliet Liaison Committee, uh, the mayor is recommending uh, Councilman Morris as the chair, Councilman Odekirk, and Councilman McFarland as members. So moved. No 
a second? I'll second it. Can we, uh, for clarification, can we do these individually? Yes, we can. If there's no other comment, perhaps we're going to have um, Krista do the roll then on the first one, which is the Economic Development Committee. Mr. Mayor? Yes. I, I have a question. Sure. Sorry, Tom. Um, you have yourself listed as a member. By mayor, aren't you a member of the committees by proxy? Yes. So there's only really two council people being appointed. The council and myself, yes. Yeah, I, I, well, for the record, I, I don't agree. I think Councilman Hug suggested this committee was his idea. I think he should be put on it. Okay. Councilman. It's been motioned and seconded that Councilman Michael Turk chair the Economic Development Committee and Mayor yeah. Thomas Durrani and Councilwoman Jan Hallams Coleman serve on the committee. Councilman McFarland? No. Councilman Morris? No. Councilman Odekirk? No. Councilman Coleman? Well, I guess I'll just vote present. Councilman Turk? Aye. Councilman Barber? Aye. Councilman Gurl? Aye. Councilman Hug? I would point out, I would thank Councilman Odekirk for mentioning it. And, and I did have a discussion. I think the, uh, the mayor would acknowledge we had a couple of discussions yes, on this. Yes. And I certainly, I certainly agree with Councilman Odekirk on the fact that, you know, we've got three new committees that we've appointed in the last month, month and a half. And those that you might consider the founding mem council members, the ones that pushed for it, were named their committees. It, it is not rational and logical to me that I was left off the very committee I pushed hard to create. So I would vote no. Mayor Durrani. Aye. Mr. Mayor, uh, members of the council, according to my uh, tally, looks like the motion failed on account of a four to four tie. The abstention can't go to either party or either side. Okay. All right. So the committee appointments have, or nominations failed. That was for the first committee. Yeah. Just for the first committee, economic development. So <clears throat> just for clarification, so where do we go with this then? There's no committee members? Well, at this point, there the nominations failed. It's... Uh, up to the mayor to decide how he would like to proceed with the nomination phase of the process. Okay. I'd like to entertain a motion to approve Councilman Mike Turk and Councilwoman Jan Quillman to the Economic Development Committee. These are my committees. I don't know. Is that in order? It is. I think we should. I'm not asking you. Well, the last motion that was voted down um, was the nomination collectively of three individual members of the council. I would leave it to the mayor to uh, state for the record if it was a collective nomination or if he's nominating them individually. It appeared to me that it was a collective nomination which failed for lack of a majority. Uh, and given that it is the mayor's prerogative as the elected mayor to initiate the nomination process. And so I think we're back to square one and it's up to the mayor to now proceed in a manner that um, he thinks is appropriate to initiate a nomination by uh, making a nomination on the floor, either today or at some future meeting. Your Honor, yes. I would move the uh, Housing Authority Liaison Committee appointments. So second. 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 It's in motion and seconded that Councilman Terry Morris serve as chair on the Housing Authority Committee and Councilman Jim McFarland and Councilman Robert Odekirk serve on the committee. Councilman Morris. Aye. Councilman Odekirk? Aye. Councilwoman Coleman? Aye. Councilman Turk? Aye. Councilwoman Barber? Aye. Councilman Girl? Aye. Councilman Hug? I would respectfully ask the uh, mayor, prior to making my vote here on the EDC, to resubmit. It is, as Jeff explained, upon him to present us with what we would deem in a majority vote as acceptable. So he needs, I think, to talk to each of the council members and resubmit at the next meeting with an acceptable. It's, it's not a rubber stamp con, uh, kind of process. Um, so I don't think just letting it hang out there for weeks and weeks and months on end is not good for the city and it's not good for this council. The EDC, the Economic Development Committee, is extremely important to this city. We're one of the only cities. There are cities with 20,000 people. There are cities with 7,000 people that have their own village EDC committee. So we cannot let this hang out. So I would respectfully request that by the next meeting, you know, obviously the ones that you originally suggested weren't to the liking of the council and as a, as a majority body, bring back a, a list of uh, three members that is to the liking of the council so that we can get at least a five vote majority. And I would vote yes 
Aye. On the uh, housing oversight. Councilman McFarland? Yes. Mayor Durrani. I don't think that's what Jeff says when he recommended uh, me bring back uh, recommendations for that committee. I vote aye. Motion carried. Move to adjourn. Hey, before you adjourn, I'd like to bring up a, a point. Um, we've been having water breaks all over the city of Joliet. And uh, on Friday night or Friday during the day, there I guess it was a water main break, unbeknownst to me, at Rainer and Western. And um, it was decided not to fix the break until possibly <coughs> Monday. And um, yesterday afternoon, when it was about 90 some degrees and it's three o'clock in the afternoon, uh, many of the residents in the cathedral area were without water, without warning. And um, I called Mr. Egan and asked him why, you know, flyers weren't sent out, reverse 911, or contacting myself or Councilman uh, Oderkirk because we do have email um, access to the cathedral area, the neighborhoods to get people notified. Because on a Sunday afternoon where people are getting ready to make dinner or, you know, they've been working outside all day, want to take a shower, and there's no water with no warning. And I just think that's an unacceptable practice. And I would like to see in the future that we do the reverse 911 if we're going to shut people's water off without any warning. Maybe Jim, Egan, can you come up and uh, give us an update on that? Mayor and Council, um, uh, the events of this past weekend, Friday evening, we had a water main break uh, in Glenwood Avenue uh, between William and Prairie Street. And during the process of making that repair, uh, the, the crew broke a valve in the intersection at Rayner and William, which forced uh, the limits of the outage to be extended uh, larger than we would like. Uh, it, it is an aging system. There were broken valves out there that uh, forced uh, you know, the ability to isolate the section where the break was at. Uh, with the, the, the break that occurred, uh, initially it was intended that we were going to try to let the break go till the week, uh, during the week, so we could get notices handout and uh, control when uh, that repair was going to be made. Um, as we were watching it over the weekend, uh, the repair or the, the leak became a little bit more severe and uh, we were going to try to fix it at nighttime on Saturday. We weren't able to put a crew together to do that and uh, the soonest we were able to get somebody out to, to work on that break and we had to replace the valve at the intersection uh, at that location uh, was Sunday afternoon. Um, you know, we've ran into this in the past about notifying uh, customers when there's going to be an outage, uh, whether it's a planned or uh, an emergency. Uh, an emergency outage is always a little bit difficult if it's planned maintenance work. We do send notices out and try to schedule that and notify the people that are going to be affected. Uh, when we get into a situation uh, when it's an emergency and we don't have the time to get notices out, uh, it makes it a little bit more difficult where we're trying to balance between uh, maintaining the, the water system or uh, trying to get notices out to people affected. We've never really had good luck, you know, knocking on doors, even though, you know, people, you know, that would have been affected immediately uh, would have had notice. Um, but, um, you know, that's something maybe we can look at. Well, excuse me, Jim. Um, you said you were going to notify the people because you were going to plan on fixing this on Monday. This is 3 o'clock in the afternoon on Sunday, and there's been no, no, I mean, you had all day Saturday, all day Sunday. We would. To notify the people. And that was not done. And when I called you about it, you did not have an answer for me. No, I didn't have an answer for you. Um, I, I didn't realize that your water was turned off. I thought. It wasn't I, just my water. I, I, mean, I understand that. It was a I, big, I big that. area where water was off. And, and I did realize, you know, with the proximity in the Kappa neighborhood, um, re realizing, you know, that. Uh, you know, the, the citizens in the area, you know, that were affected by it probably would have been calling you. I mean, a phone call in the morning would have been nice, let people give them some, you know, heads up uh, so they could plan uh, for it. 
you know, and, and the other thing is, um, <laughs> you know, when, when it snows, we send a crew out in the middle of the night to get everything ready for the next morning, okay? Um, why wasn't a night crew sent out so that no one would have been affected, everybody would have been sleeping, you know, on Sunday night or even Saturday night? Uh, we don't have night crews, so if, if anybody came out after hours, it's uh, overtime. And well, it's, it's overtime for snow removal, too. Yes. I mean, these are emergencies. I mean, this is the middle of summer, and, the, and it just didn't make any sense to me for a Sunday afternoon when it's 90 degrees to shut everybody's people water off without giving them some kind of warning. And I just would like this council to put something in effect that when this does happen, we do a 911 reverse call, or you know, we send emails out to our constituents, or if it's gonna be a couple days ahead of time, you know, get some emails or mailings or postcards or something like that, but we need to, we need to take care of this. One of the programs that we have looked at and, uh, and I think would work well is to uh, have an email system uh, working off of our GIS map for where our customers are at and anybody that's able to sign up that we're able to uh, do either a text message to a cell phone or uh, an email blast uh, you know, just to get some kind of a notice out. Um, you know, one of the things that we can look at doing on a short term, uh, you know, there is a, a, a short window once the crew uh, shows up on the scene <coughs> uh, that they're able to, you know, the house is immediately within the proximity uh, that they're able to go through and, you know, knock on a few doors and let, you know, a few people know. Um, it, with the event that, that occurred on Friday night because uh, it was a, the valve broke and it, it forced them to expand the shutdown area, a situation like that, um, you know, would still occur. Uh, but again, usually, you knew on Friday night, but yet there was no notification on Sunday. But over over 32 hours had passed. I, if, I, if I may. Yeah. Josh, she's done, yeah, sure. I, I guess going forward, I agree with Councilwoman Quillman, there should be an emphasis on telling people. I mean, I understand, I saw the crews working Friday night when I walked my dog. Um, I know the water was out overnight for some period, probably didn't affect too many people. And I guess what you're saying, Sunday kind of took you by surprise. You, you were hoping to last longer. So I, when I got the phone call, I was able to tell people, but I'm sure there's a lot of people who didn't know that it was coming and could have prepared otherwise. Your Honor, hey Jim, you know, I got a text today from the, I'm signed up for that Joliet Police Department text, you know, for the heat advisory and safety tips and things like that. You know, could we maybe work with that system? I know, a lot of people will get that text that don't live in that area, but I mean, they could just dismiss it where, I mean, that seems like a pretty good way of reaching people, with, which is uh, kind of a simple way of doing it. I, I so think. We, can, we could try doing something like that. I mean, when we've looked at that in the past, uh, because that does encompass uh, a larger area and we're usually trying to be more specific on a block right. by block basis, uh, it makes it a little uh, more difficult, but you know, we could work with uh, uh, Chief Police Crafton Department. and um, you know. well, I have a question for the chief. Chief, can we block off an area to make 91 reverse 911 calls, sectors, different sectors? We can. We can. So there's our option right there. Okay. Everybody can be notified with reverse 911 call when it's an emergency like that. If you're going to know a couple days in advance, we can do something different. But something like that, it, we need to do reverse 911. Okay, we can look into that. I haven't said that. Uh, thank you, because you guys got the, the problem fixed. So yes. They were working all weekend. They worked hard, too, and it was hot out there. So thank yep. you. You're welcome. Crews did an excellent job. I know everybody's, everybody's anxious to, uh, to depart here, but uh, I'd like to go back on the topic uh, for some legal advice from uh, Mr. Plyman on the marital appointments. Maybe you can clarify, because I'm a little confused on your, your comment here. If the appointments for the positions run with the term of the elected office, am I correct for the for the appointments on the council committees? So for instance, Councilman Turr, Councilman Quillman, and the mayor's terms are all different. How can we take one vote to appoint all three when all the terms are different? This isn't a, a Councilman, this is not a, an issue of when terms start or finish. Um, this has to do with the mayoral uh, authority to make nominations, how they're made, and then how the council exercises its uh, ratification uh, authority that it has. And what actually happened in this case is that the mayor placed um, nominations on the floor. There was a motion made 
that to have those that nomination recommendation uh, approved. That motion was seconded. It was all done as a group. That motion was they weren't read on. off though. I don't think the. I'll uh -uh. let you finish, but they weren't individually read off. It was a blanket motion and it was a blanketed second for all for both committees until I interjected and said, "Can we split these?" Right. And then my, we did the one vote. No, I the reason why I'm bringing this up, and I think it's important for the public to realize, is you're seeing politics at its greatest here. This city is in long overneed time of economic development. We as a council voted 9-0 to put this committee forth to start pushing recommendations through that the mayor's own CARB committee brought forth. And I think this politics has got to stop and we need to start addressing issues. We'll leave it lay at where it is today. All right. But I am sick and tired and I am not going to sit here as an elected official representing every single resident in this city of Joliet to allow the stifling of business to progress up here. Whether or not the differences are between you and Councilman Hug is one thing. But if you look at the long history of appointments on these committees and any committee you see of an official as a mayor or a president of a board, there are ex officios on every single committee of that board, whether it's in a nonprofit or an elected position. And this is politics at its best. And I'm not going to tolerate it, and I'm going to continue bringing this up until we get a committee formed and we start addressing the economic woes of this city here. We have been doing that. I have been doing that. I've been doing it for two years, and it's not politics. When this committee was voted to, to take effect, I, Mike Kirk called me and asked me to be on the committee. He is the senior member of this council, all right? I am next senior. I want to be on this committee. Councilwoman Quimmel was third. I called her and asked her if she wanted to be on the committee, and she says she did. That's what, and I did the same thing with the... Uh, uh, Housing Authority Committee. I contacted Councilman Hug if he wanted to be on it. He didn't want to be on it. He told me he wanted to be on the EDC committee and he wanted to be chairman. I said, that's been taken care of. And I went down the seniority list. I contacted Councilman Girl. He didn't want to be on the Housing Authority Committee. And I went right down the list on seniority and who wanted to be on it. That's what I did. You call it politics, you call it whatever you want, it's seniority. And that's how I decided who was going to be on those committees. Mayor, I would just correct you on one thing because I received the email from you about the um, Housing Authority Committee. Yes, you did approach me. You picked, I, I don't know if junior, senior is the right uh, term. You picked Councilman, um, on that committee, you picked Councilman Morris, a junior member, Councilman Oderkirk, a junior member, and myself, a junior member. No, you did not apply seniority across the three new, uh, the three new committees. And when I sent back to you that I would like to be on the committee and would put my name up as chairman if you so saw fit, I got no response. For two weeks, I got no response. I can bring the emails I, up. I'm not questioning you, Councilman, but you say it's not seniority. I went to, I went to Councilman Girl. He didn't want it. Councilman uh, Morris, Councilman Oderkirk, and yourself were all even in seniority. He is the youngest man, and when you refuse, I put him on the committee. That's seniority. So you went to Councilman Girl after me? Uh, first. No, I went to Councilman Girl, and he refused. Councilman Girl refused. That was after me. Yeah. Mayor. No, well... I was one of the first three, and I gave you that very polite email saying that I wish to spend my time on well, a full committee on the EDC. Originally, he okayed, and then he backed out, and he says he didn't want it. Well, that I wouldn't be, I wouldn't okay. be privy to. Okay. All so right. there's really only one question left for the public and for the, your colleagues on the council. Are you going to respond to the will of co the council, do the right thing, and name three new people at the next meeting, or are you going to stonewall it and ignore the will of the majority council and ignore the people of Joliet? That's the last, last only question. I, I, I propose my committee, okay? Right now, I'm going to stick with that. i got to talk to Jeff. Call it politics, call it, you, call it what you want. Yeah. It was done by seniority. Entertain a motion to adjourn. Any, any other comments? Okay. I need a second. Is there a second? Second. second. Motion and seconded to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Meeting adjourned.